Hi there, good to see you again. Last week we discussed among, amongst others the definition of terrorism and the nature of the phenomenon. And in the forum I observed quite a number of different opinions about what constitutes terrorism and what not. And the same holds for the labeling of certain groups. Well here's a questionnaire to start with. We have these lists of terrorist organizations and I want your opinion on it. What do you think of these kind of lists and what do you think about certain groups? What groups should be on the list uh, and are not on any list yet? Is, is that okay or do you disagree with that? Take your time, have a good look at it. It's important as it, this questionnaire is part of our joint research effort that is an essential part of this course. Thank you for filling out the questionnaire and I'm looking forward to see and analyze the results and share them with you in the forum. This week we're going to look into the study of terrorism and counterterrorism. So what are we going to do this week? Well here's a list of uh, topics that we're going to discuss. The history of terrorism studies and the disciplines and approaches. What scholars, what um, different centers have produced the many reports and studies that have been published in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, we're going to have a look at the names and faces of some of the key authors and where they conducted their studies. And then we're going to look at an important part uh, and that's challenges and dilemmas. Well doing social research, uh, social science research in general is, is difficult but studying terrorism is particularly difficult. Think about uh, the problem of secrecy. And finally we got a look at the current state of the art, what key authors, key scholars said about the quantity and quality of what has been produced in recent years. And we will provide, of course, the weekly quiz. In this video we're going to look at the history of terrorism and counterterrorism studies. Well, terrorism is not new and the same holds for the study of this phenomenon. We're going to look at modern day terrorism meaning the terrorism that emerged in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So what did they focus on in those days? Well they focused on for instance conflict theory. Why do people fight each other? Why do they use violence? Uh, especially with a political science background they looked at the phenomenon, the new phenomenon uh, of for instance decolonization, riots, violence but also riots and violence in Western European cities and North American cities. So the political violence in general was, uh, was studied either under the name terrorism studies or political violence studies. And the groups they looked at were anti-imperialist and revolutionary terrorist groups and one of them was an organization called the Weather Underground that started on a campus in North America and it, it can be labeled as Marxist, Leninist, left-wing kind of terrorism. At those days I don't think they used that term, but well, it's definitely something what we uh, would uh, label it now. And it's the start of a, a number of red terrorist groups that uh, would dominate also very much uh, the news in the 1970s. The 1970s and 1980s saw much more attention to the modus operandi of terrorist groups. The, the techniques, the methods they used, the target selection and the targets of those days were a lot of uh, hijackings and hostage takings. Well here's just a, a few examples of red organizations that were active in these times. So uh, people with a, a Marxist Leninist background, uh, uh, extremist left groups. Uh, here you see the logo of the Rote Armee Faction, which was active in Germany. If you want to know more about it, I can recommend, uh, recommend a number of books, but I think my best recommendation would be to watch the movie Bader Meinhof Complex, a very interesting movie that shows you a bit of the context uh, in which the group was operating those days, uh, and also the motivations of some of the individual members to, to join that struggle and also a lot of violence that was um, uh, connected to that group, Bader Meinhof Complex. Actually if you want to uh, learn more about tips for movies uh, you can find it on the course dashboard. You also see a picture here of Alberto Moro, a key leader, politician in Italy who was taken hostage by the Red Brigade in Italy. Again um, um, 
a, a source for a lot of filmmakers to make a movie about. Um, I can recommend Buongiorno Notte, a very nice movie uh, that looks into the dilemmas also of those who were involved in taking uh, um, this man hostage. And there's another movie I have over here, it's called uh, Aldo Moro, uh, starring Michele uh, Placido, uh, one of the leading movie stars in Italy. An excellent movie that also shows all the dilemmas of those who were fighting the Red Brigade and also the members of the group. Uh, in the end, I think this particular hostage taking was disastrous for many people, including the Red Brigade itself. And you see a picture of the Japanese Red Army, the Japanese Red Army, yes, uh, uh, an active group, not only in Japan, but actually just here, 200 meters from my office, there's the French embassy. And they stormed that embassy in 1974, uh, trying to press the release of one of their fighters. Actually, they managed to do so, and they managed to get away with it on a plane. In, uh, in the end, they managed to escape to Syria. And that international connection was also something of great interest to researchers in those days, the international dimension. The, the combination of Japanese Red Army and Palestinian groups attacking in Europe or in Singapore. It was really very international already in those days. And of course, researchers were very much interested in how these uh, groups operated. In the 1990s, as in previous decades, scholars focused mainly on the, the topics of those days, the groups that were active, the way they staged attacks and the way government reacted to that. And in the 1990s, these were the nationalist separatist groups. Of course, they were active also in the decades before that, but there was a lot of study, a lot of publications on, for instance, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, uh, fighting in the United Kingdom, and the ETA, the Basque separatist group, in Spain, but also groups in India and Sri Lanka, the Tamil Tigers, for instance. Another type of terrorism that was studied were what we would call Islamist groups. It's a difficult term, but let me label it as Islamist groups, as most scholars did in those days. And they were looking at, for instance, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the reaction of the Israeli and other authorities to those activities, to new types of attacks, suicide attacks, for instance. And there was also attention for the first time to a new group. Here you see a quote by uh, the CIA, a quote that also appears in the report of the commission that looked into the terrorist attacks on 9-11. And the quote is from that report uh, saying the CIA noticed a recent stream of reports about bin Laden and something called Al-Qaeda. That was in 1995. And a few years later, there was a lot more attention to this group called so-called group Al-Qaeda. And that was after, you see a picture of it here, after the attacks on the US embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi in East Africa. But in general, the 1990s saw a decline in academic interest. We couldn't have known in those days that Al-Qaeda, the so-called Islamic State, other jihadist groups and other types of terrorism would be so dominant in the following 15 years. But in those days, there was a decline in interest. Fewer and fewer scholars were focusing on terrorism as an interesting subject to study. That something called Al-Qaeda received a lot more attention after the biggest terrorist attack ever, the ones on 11 September 2001, where almost 3,000 people were killed. Well, that attack also is the starting point of an enormous growth in the field of terrorism and counterterrorism study. An enormous growth in terms of the number of scholars and experts that were looking into this phenomena. Um, many of them, most of them today, are post 9 11 researchers. I'm one of them. And you also saw a number of new research centers being established. Uh, the, the Center of Terrorism and Counterterrorism at Leiden University is, for instance, one of them. And you saw an enormous increase in training, policy advice and consultancy as government wanted, of course, answers to all kinds of questions. Who is threatening us? Why? What can we do about it? How do we make sure that we don't do the wrong things and do the right things? All kinds of questions popped up and um, uh, scholars, uh, research centers tried to answer some of these uh, questions and provide their services. 
And this resulted, of course, in enormous growth of reports, books, articles, enormous growth in publications. The number of books with terrorism in the title. You see that the number of titles, book titles, doubled in the decade after 9-11. And don't forget on the left hand side you see in blue uh, everything published uh, in the years before 9-11 and that means in all the decades before 9-11. And then after 9-11, well, we're talking about 12, 13 years. So an enormous growth in the number of publications and the same holds for uh, say more academic publications. If you look at Google Scholar and you look at the number of articles with terrorism in the title, it's, it's more than, it doubled in 12 years' time. So what have we learned? We looked into the development of terrorism and counterterrorism studies starting in the early 1960s with just a handful of scholars, then a growth in the 1970s and 1980s and a decline in the 1990s, which was followed by an enormous increase after the attacks on 9-11. In the next video, we're going to look at the various disciplines and approaches of research into terrorism and counterterrorism.